Hello everybody. Welcome to the Great Pacific Clouds Guide to Nudibranchs and Sea Slugs. So what we're looking at here is a nudibranch and the question is, is a nudibranch and a sea slug the same thing? No, it's not. So this is a sarcoglossum. It's a different kind of sea slug. It's a relative of the nudibranchs, but not the same thing. Now, all of these sea slugs belong to a group called the mollusks. And generally, it makes a lot of sense when you look at an animal to understand what are its relatives, what are its sisters and cousins. Now, the mollusks are a big group and they're divided into a group which is called Aculifera, which are very interesting but somewhat uh, primitive animals which you don't find very often. And a bigger group co called Conchifera and they really contain all of the mollusks you will typically see. And what are they? So, uh, first of all, they are the bivalves or the clams. What you see here is a giant clam breeding area which the University of the Philippines has set up so that they can restock wild populations. So these are massive animals, uh, up to several hundred kilos, and they are bivalves, they are clams, but you know, so are the animals which you might eat with your, your pasta vongole in an Italian restaurant. There you can see one of these giant clams in a laboratory setting. Another group of animals within the mollusks are the cephalopods, the octopi, the squid, and the cuttlefish, uh, including the uh, more primitive nautilus. Now this, what you see here is a wonderpus, which is a really rare tropical octopus. Uh, I was quite excited to find one of these. Now, all of the sea slugs <clears throat> belong to a group called the gastropods. So this is a family tree of the gastropods. And the, all of the, the neurobranchs are a, in a subgroup called the heterobranchs. And the, an older name was opistobranchs, but that's somewhat of an unclear concept. So now, not every gastropod is a slug. So many are snails, right? So what's a slug? A snail without a shell. So this is a cassis, what you see here, a very large marine snail. And what you see here is a type of sea hare. So this is also a marine gastropod mollusk. It's a sea slug, but it's not yet a nudibranch. So nudibranch, essentially the nude in nudibranch means that the gills are exposed. Now, what you can see here, we had a similar animal already. This is a sarcoglossum. This is or sometimes called a sap-sucking slug. So again, we have a marine gastropod mollusk, but it's not a nudibranch. Same here. This is a pleurobranch. This is yet another group of marine gastropod mollusks. But they, so these are animals which have lost their shell but they're not nudibranchs. So again, this is a sister group to the actual nudibranchs. So you can see that there's a wide biodiversity of sea slugs which are not nudibranchs. So this finally is the family tree in the, in the bottom of the nudibranchs. And you can see that there is a large number of different subgroups and you know, there are this, uh, these eolids with these tassels in the back and uh, the dorids. So there is a ver great variety of nudibranchs. So finally, here we have a, I believe that's a tambia. So this is a nudibranch. You can see the nude or exposed gills. And there is a massive number of species of these, particularly in the tropical Pacific, in the coral triangle, I think it's probably fair to say that they are, they have adapted to many different food sources. So here I sped up that video; that animal doesn't actually move that fast. So what's worth stressing in the end, uh, you know, when talking about taxonomy, that there are also flatworms, and f here you can see a flatworm. A flatworm is not a mollusk, it's not a sea slug, this just looks somewhat similar. Now, we should also look at the anatomy 
of the sea slugs and of this nudibranchs. So very striking are the gills, the highly branched. Any multicellular animal on this planet needs oxygen. I think there are one or two exceptions, some small worms. Animals generally need oxygen and the seawater contains oxygen and these gills is where the nudibranchs uh, take up oxygen. In a lot of other sea slugs they're retracted or they're in some kind of orifice in some kind of body cavity. Now very striking also at the front of these animals are the rhinopores. So these rhinopores are feelers but they're generally not there to uh, have a sense of touch. They're olfactory organs so they're there to smell things out. So I think it's fair to believe that there are so many nudibranch species because they're very specialized in their food sources so they need to be capable of finding the right food source for their particular taste and with that they for that they use these uh, rhinopores. They have different branching patterns. It's quite interesting to look at them in close focus if you have a good macro camera. This again is a C here. You can see that small eye and these uh, can see a little bit. A lot of actual nudibranchs are blind. So on this animal here you can see no eyes at all. This animal exclusively finds its way through the ocean and over the sand, through the reefs, by smelling things out. Now, a very interesting question is, what are nudibranchs feeding on? How do they sustain themselves? And most importantly, their mouth, their jaw, is the so-called radula. So on the right of this image here, you can see a close-up of such a calcified hard tongue. The link to the paper from which I took that image is in the description. So this is something all gastropod mollusks have and depending on the species of nudibranch or sea slug this can be very different. Now this nudibranch here is chewing a hydroid. What's a hydroid? It's essentially a jellyfish which grows on the seafloor on a stalk. Uh, hydroids are very uh, stingy, uh, they sting very powerfully. Very inter interestingly, this nudibranch here then uses the stinging cell and incorporates them into its body as a defensive measure. So, next here we have a nudibranch which I think is chewing on some hydroids. You can see them on the bottom left and the hydroids are growing on a sponge. Now, it's a observation which I've made myself and also something which you get from the scientific literature that a lot of these nudibranchs are extreme food specialists. They will only feed on a few or even one uh, prey species. Here, again, we have the sarcoglossan, which again is, is not a nudibranch but a sea slug. I, that was me pointing at the animal on this algae. So, this sea slug then feeds on that algae, so it's a herbivore, a plant eater, and they are also highly specialized for only feeding on that semicircular algae, which you can very often see in sandy areas, you know, in sh rather shallow waters, shallower than 15 meters. Interestingly, just like the uh, sea slug before, it would incorporate the parts of the algae into its body to keep doing photosynthesis, to keep generating energy out of sunlight once it had eaten that algae. So basically it's using the organelles, the chloroplasts of the algae after it had dined on the algae. So it's essentially stealing the solar panels of the algae fascinating stuff and there is another nudibranch which is capable of incorporating cells of its prey into its own body so you know the thing about nudibranchs really is that their evolution 
led to a massive explosion in species. And this is called the, the adaptive radiation. And this happens in oceans all over the world, but this particularly happened in the Indo-Pacific and in the, what's called the Coral Triangle. So this area between the Philippines, Eastern Indonesia and Papua New Guinea, where our marine biodiversity is highest. And marine biodiversity there is highest for corals, it's highest for uh, reef fishes, but it's also highest for nudibranchs. And the thing which gave rise to that nudibranch speciation, as I have uh, pointed out before, is I believe in many cases that these animals became very specialized on one or a few prey animals. So if there are a thousand different prey animals, that would give you, you know, at least several hundred uh, nudibranchs which feed on them. And these would often be sponges, hydroids, tunicates. Very often, of course, this would be immobile parts of the fauna which grow on the bottom. Obviously, these nudibranchs are not very good at chasing stuff. Some nudibranchs or chase other nudibranchs and eat them. Now, what are we looking at when we see a sea slug? We see an animal which is small, which is soft, which has lost its shell in evolution, which is quite slow, which doesn't have any teeth to fight off a potential predator. So how come they still exist and they don't get eaten all the time and disappear? Now, the answer seems to be Whenever this has been studied, in many cases, they are poisonous. Their bodies contain noxious substances which make a predatory fish either sick and the fish would throw up or would even kill the fish. So, fishers hence avoid feeding on nudibranchs. These toxic substances, can, these poisons in the bodies of nudibranchs can be either made by their own bodies or like in the case of this eolid, so this is a species which is often called purple dragon, this eolid here has the capability to take up stinging cells from anemones or hydroids, store them in its body, so, so this animal then becomes stinging on its own. Now, What's also quite interesting, a lot of these nudibranchs have these warning colors. And this is like in a bee or in a wasp, which basically says, you know, look at me, I'm so colorful, I'm advertising that I'm poisonous, that I'm dangerous. So in many cases, nudib the very gaudy coloration of nudibranchs, which make them so appealing to the underwater naturalist and photographer, are warning colors to say, you know, stop, you know, don't eat me, you will regret it. And this animal we already looked at, so, you know, it's in the process of chewing down this hydroid, and again, it will store the stinging cells of the hydroid in its body. There is another way of how nudibranchs can be safe. Very often, uh, there are more of them out at night, so they avoid dealing with dangerous predatory animals which are active during the day and rather they come out at night and so this one saw my video light and it then decided to disappear. Now finally when the sea slugs have managed to feed on enough tunicates or sponges or hydroids and when they have managed not to end up as somebody else's lunch they will want to reproduce. Now, these two have climbed up on a piece of seaweed. The interesting thing about reproduction in these gastropod mollusks is that they're typically hermaphrodites, meaning that each animal is a functional male and female at the same time. That does not mean that during each and every mating they play the male and the female role, but typically they can play both roles in reproduction. This is a very curious case where I saw a group of three pleurobranchs mate. And so you can do the math. It's actually not that simple how many different combinations of matings uh, there are possible. With three animals mating and each can be a male or a female or both. And finally, 
I filmed some uh, a different species of pleuroprank, and the, this is a really uh, rare one. It's called Oselinops luniceps. I, I was very happy to find this animal just. Uh, generally, you know, uh, encounter this animal, but then it was, it was even more uh, stunning to see that they were mating. So this is typically a process which, uh, in the case of these pleuropranks, took about 10 minutes, and then later on they will go and lay eggs, and from which the larvae will hatch, and eventually they will settle back on a reef, and this cycle repeats. Now, this structure here on the marine plant, that's also a sea slug. So you can see how crazily camouflaged they often are. And this animal was no bigger than five millimeters. So they're often very hard to see underwater. I hope you have enjoyed this tour through the biology of sea slugs. Please check out my books. Links are in the description. I wrote your brain on diving about hyperbaric physiology and what, what happens in human brains when people go free diving or scuba diving. And then there's the life of gobies. Uh, the gobies are a fascinating group of marine fishes with lots and lots of species and coming out very soon, environmental problems in the ocean with James Reimer, 25 future dives. See you soon.